Hello, my name is Dr. Cheryl Burdett, and I am the clinical director for Origins Incubator. And this week in our clinical curriculum classes, we talked about adrenal fatigue. And the question was brought up, does adrenal fatigue actually exist? And this is an interesting question, because if we think of it in terms of where is the ICD-10, where is the diagnostic code that goes with that, answer would be no. Because the, the when we think about function of the adrenal glands, a diagnostic criteria is given for if the adrenal glands are completely on overload or if they are completely shut off. Cushing's or Addison's disease. But as we know, so many things exist in a, in a spectrum. There is not tissue in the body uh, that is merely all on or all off. Your heart doesn't completely function or not at all. The lungs don't completely function or not at all. The, the retina in your eye doesn't completely function or not at all. All tissue is on a spectrum and all of it uh, can be increased and improved or decreased. And there are so many things that affect the functioning level of the tissue of the adrenals. But when we continue to look at this issue, um, it, it is further uh, talked about that, well, of course, it's not merely the adrenals itself. And that is important to realize that it's the whole hypothalamic pituitary axis. And it is how sensitive the adrenals are to the signaling. But in addition to that, there are changes that will happen at a tissue level when we experience extreme levels of stress. And so we looked at some studies in which kiddos had experienced a high level of trauma. And normally the trauma was a, a sexual trauma. And so when children had experienced this excessive stress, also these studies looked at kids who had been Holocaust survivors. And so when these kiddos had experienced extensive stress, there was there was large changes to how their body recognize and metabolize stress hormones such as cortisol. So often we'll define adrenal fatigue as a decrease in the adrenal's ability to make cortisol. And so in these studies, they looked at people with post-traumatic stress disorder, again, kiddos who had been through the Holocaust or who had also been sexually abused. And what they saw in these children is that indeed they did have lower levels of cortisol, but this was only in part because of decreased cortisols made by the adrenals and might not have been at all because of dysfunction in the adrenal. In fact, what the research went on to say is that how cortisol was read and interpreted at a receptor level uh, varied post-trauma. So this cortisol, this glucocorticoid, when somebody had been under significant stress, it upregulated enzymes in the kidney and in the liver to break down cortisol at a faster rate. And we can see why this would make sense because initially when we're under more stress, lots of cortisol, you've got to keep up with that overproduction, that heightened amount that occurs. However, if we are in, in the population that was not resilient, uh, that had post-traumatic stress disorder, more long long-term effects from severe stress, you saw a different outcome in terms of what their body did with cortisol. So they continued to have that increased metabolism of cortisol, but the receptor became more sensitive to it. And so when we think about this from an evolutionary perspective, we can understand why the biochemistry would be this way. Well, cortisol is not only a stress hormone, but it goes up for what is probably evolutionarily the, the largest stress to our system starvation. So if we were starving, we produce more cortisol. It tells the liver to increase gluconeogenesis, uh, to make more sugar, to help us survive. It tells the kidney to reabsorb uh, salt. So if we're in a starvation situation where we're not getting calories, we're not getting salt, then the metabolism is changed um, so that the liver and the kidney will deal with that situation 
and continue to uh, to make these make uh, keep us alive even under the stressful situation of starvation. So you starve, your stress hormone goes up, cortisol, and then an adaptation to that is to make the receptor more sensitive to that cortisol. So from there, after long term stress, what happens is there's an increase in metabolism of cortisol. Your body trying to get back to homeostasis, but if we don't respond, if we're not resilient to the trauma, the receptor stays the same. So now that the cortisol goes down, but yet the receptor is more sensitive to it. And so when this person experiences more stress that would that would peak cortisol again, they feel it more intently. So normally we're under stress, we, we the, this is an adaptation. We see the bear, we need to run. We produce the cortisol in the right amount so that we're able to stay focused and we're able to run, we're able to get out of there. But the person who produces that same heightened cortisol, but also with a receptor that's more sensitive to it, now they feel that more intensely, more palpitations and ability to focus more in the direction of a panic attack. And so we might initially look at this low cortisol and say the adrenal is, the gland is failing, but it might not really be the adrenal gland in and of itself, but these responses that happen. And it is fascinating to learn that these changes in how the liver metabolizes cortisol, this change in how the kidney metabolizes cortisol can stay with us more lifelong, particularly in people that have post-traumatic stress disorder. And in addition to that, when your cortisol was low, if we could get it back into a normal range, people had benefit from that. Not, not a sudden stress where it was heightened and your receptor was more sensitive, but a normal level of cortisol, which would allow that receptor to begin to read it uh, over time at a normal level, would send the appropriate feedback uh, to the pituitary gland so we can put the whole system back in balance. But such a take home message to realize that stress affects us right down to the tissue, right down to our glucocorticoid receptor. And this research went on to say that it was not a state, but it was a trait that you could pass on this change in metabolism of cortisol to your offspring. In fact, they looked at women who were pregnant during the Holocaust and also women who were pregnant within a mile radius of 911 and found that yes, these, this metabolism in their cortisol changed and they passed it on to their offspring. So how fascinating is it to, to think about that something like adrenals and fatigue and cortisol level is not merely the adrenal, but it's how the brain is reading that. And it's how the tissue is receiving it. And it's how the liver and kidney are ultimately metabolizing it. And it shows us why we have to work within a functional paradigm that realizes it's not just an adrenal gland, but it's a person that surrounds an ad adrenal gland, that there's a, there's a metabolism and a read and and a, uh, and a change to that cortisol based on what we've experienced in the past, even based on what our, our mother and father have experienced in the past. So always so much to learn, even about a topic that we think might just be as simple as the adrenals. We realize these interconnections are what makes the functional medicine approach so important that it is also epigenetic and it is a diet and a lifestyle paradigm that recognizes these epigenetics and how all of these pieces work together.